everybody. Welcome back to Asymptotics and Perturbation Methods. We have just six lectures left, this being the first of the six. And um, for much of that time, we'll be talking about a, a very fundamental method known as the method of multiple scales. This is our last big topic of the course. Um, so let me just dive right in. I, I want to show you a couple examples of how this method gets used on problems having to do with nonlinear oscillations. Okay. All right, so by my reckoning, this is now part eight of the whole course, um, lecture 22. All right, so if you wanna uh, keep up with this in Bender and Orsog, this is in their chapter 11. And um, so as I say, these techniques, multiple scale methods frequently get illustrated on problems of nonlinear oscillators. And I'm gonna follow that tradition. So let me begin with um, something that people refer to as the Duffing oscillator. I'm not sure, I'm, I think I'm probably saying that wrong. I think it's a German guy's name. So if you're a German speaker, you would could correct me on that. Anyone happen to know, what would that be? Duffing, Duffing, I don't know. Everyone always says Duffing in English. But anyway, I think the guy's name might be Georg or something like that. I should look that up. Okay, but anyway, so what's the deal with his oscillator? Well, it's um, a variant on a simple harmonic oscillator. So it has a governing equation, y double dot plus y plus a small nonlinear term, epsilon y cubed equals zero. So here this epsilon much less than one as usual. And, um, the dots refer to time derivative. So um, whereas in boundary layer theory, we we're often thinking of the independent variable X as being space. And similarly, when we did the WKB method, we were often thinking of space. It's pretty customary here to think of the independent variable as time. And so that's why I'm using dot, the old ancient, um, Isaac Newton notation for, for time derivative. Very customary in dynamical systems. All right, so anyway, there's my oscillator and we're going to assume some simple initial conditions. Um, actually, that's another distinction from what we've been doing recently. Instead of boundary value problems where we give side conditions at either end of an interval, here we're gonna typically give all of our side conditions at one point, which we think of as the initial point for this oscillation, so an initial condition. And so we're gonna be doing initial value problems rather than boundary value problems. Anyway, so simple initial conditions here would be y of zero, let's say is equal to one and y dot of zero is zero. All right, so let's suppose we wanna focus on this for a little while. Now, you might be wondering where would anything like this ever come up? So if you wanna think about it from the standpoint of classical mechanics, um, you could think of this as a uh, sort of a generalization of the old first year physics problem of a mass hanging from a spring and bobbing up and down, except that here, rather than a linear restoring force, we could think of this force, like sort of interpreting this equation as F equals MA, um, for a mass one of un one unit of mass, uh, the y double dot being the acceleration, it's like the restoring force f of y is um, negative y minus epsilon y cubed. You could think of it that way. This would be a weakly nonlinear restoring force um, where 
So let's say for a weekly week, because the epsilon is small, nonlinear spring. And so the, if you think of this as a, a restoring force, let me draw this picture this way. So think of Y as being a displacement. You know, so I'm stretching my spring by some amount Y from its relaxed length. And then the restoring force that it exerts in response to that, I mean, the negative sign is because it's in the opposite direction, right? If I stretch this way, it's pulling back in the other direction. But just if I look at the magnitude of this restoring force, then um, the straight line case, so when epsilon is zero, have something like this, that's a linear spring. That's the easy case that we all do in our first physics course. But what we're looking at here when the epsilon is positive would be something that has this kind of cubic behavior. Um, I mean, it starts out linear, but then it grows. So this is considered a hardening spring. Meaning that it gets harder in the sense of it gets stiffer. The more you stretch it, the stiffer it becomes. So it pulls back more than proportional to the um, displacement. So um, that's the epsilon greater than zero case. And then you could also have something that looks like this. That'd be if we're not gonna study this right now, if the epsilon were negative, this would be a softening spring. So it gets less stiff as you stretch it. Anyway, so back in the 1950s, people, did a lot of studying of nonlinear oscillations with weak nonlinear um, corrections to some linear behavior. All right. So um, if you think about the problem, then as I say, just as a mass bobbing on a spring that happens to get a little stiffer as you stretch it, notice I don't have any damping in my equation. I mean, it's just some kind of weird spring and a mass. So by physical um, intuition, you would still sort of figure that you're going to have conservation of energy. It's just going to be spring potential energy and kinetic energy of this mass. And so it should just execute some periodic motion for all time. It's not going to damp out or grow in its, in its um, amplitude. We could prove that, you know, with techniques of nonlinear dynamics, basically from energy conservation. So just saying that on qualitative grounds, we expect the solution to this initial value problem, y, which depends on both t and epsilon. We expect the solution of our problem to be um, periodic. as I say, since no damping or forcing is present. Or, you know, there's no external force on this. Um, it sounds like I'm hearing somebody eating lunch, so you may want to mute yourself. <laughs> Though I don't mind, but uh, I just ate lunch myself. Anyway, so we want to now try to approximate that solution for small epsilon to see what's happening. Okay, now the most naive thing that you could try, always the most naive thing, would be do regular perturbation theory. Just look for a solution in the form of a power series in epsilon. And so I'm gonna do that quite a few times today because it's instructive. Today, today's lecture is a lot about what doesn't work, actually. You know, this is the part of the course where we're talking about singular perturbation theory, all the cases where regular perturbation theory doesn't work. Um, and so let's just see what goes wrong with regular perturbation theory.
Let's try this first. And this will also motivate why we have to introduce the method of multiple scales. So uh, this will fail in an interesting way. because this problem that we're looking at is singularly perturbed. Like a lot of the other stuff we've been looking at. Okay, so um, the regular perturbation move would be to just try writing Y of T and epsilon, try writing it as y0 of t plus epsilon y1 of t plus epsilon squared y2 of t, et cetera. And um, then plug that into the differential equation. So if we substitute that into the ODE, which maybe I should label these back here, right? This was my ODE, Duffing's equation. Initial conditions. So putting it in the ODE, we get, uh, we just keep the order epsilon terms, but not epsilon squared. So we have that stuff, double dot. Plus then there was a term Y, so that would be Y zero plus epsilon Y one plus dot, dot, dot. And then plus the interesting term epsilon times Y cubed. So Y zero plus epsilon Y one plus dot, 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 all cubed is zero. And then we want to read off the um, differential equations implied at each order of epsilon. So collecting the terms at order one, meaning stuff with no epsilon in it, um, we're just left with y zero double dot plus y zero equals zero, telling us that this problem is a small perturbation of an ordinary simple harmonic oscillator. Not surprisingly, because we just have that weakly nonlinear spring. So there's that. Now we can also read off the initial conditions. Um, you know, I mean, if I come back here and look at those initial conditions and plug in my perturbation on SOTs for these two terms, and, and then sort of regard these as statements that are true of power series in epsilon, right? They have to be true at each order of epsilon, then you can read off what happens by just equating the terms with the same coefficient, same powers of epsilon. So anyway, we've done that kind of thing many times in this course. I'll take it that you can figure out how to do that. You would get here at order one, simply that y0 of zero is one and y0 dot of zero will be zero. So that's my order one problem. And that is just a simple harmonic oscillator that's been displaced to one unit of Y. So when you solve that, you'll get Y zero of T is cosine T. Okay, now at order epsilon, the equations become y1 double dot plus y1. Those are terms coming from right here. There's the epsilon y1 double dot. Here's the epsilon y1. And then we have to look for a term of order epsilon generated by this whole expression, the cubic term. And since it has a prefactor of epsilon there, the only term of order epsilon in the whole thing, as opposed to higher orders, is this epsilon to the first times this y zero cubed. So 
that is it. Everything else is higher order in epsilon. So we're, we're then gonna get plus y zero cubed equals zero. That's the differential equation. Um, which if you then substitute that y zero in there, you're left with this equation for the unknown y one, y one double dot plus y one equals negative cosine cubed T, which we'll deal with in a minute, but let's also look at its initial conditions. They would turn out to be Y1 of zero is zero um, because this term already, I mean, this, this already took care of the displacement of one initially. So at order epsilon, there's zero displacement. And the derivative initial condition is y1 dot at zero is zero. Um, so I'll solve that in a minute. Is there any question about anything so far, the setup or what we're doing? Okay. All right. Now, this is um, the kind of thing that they teach you in your first differential equations course. It's, I mean, if you stare at this, it's a linear differential equation with constant coefficients. It's got a right-hand side. So there's some forcing on there. It's a little bit tricky with the cosine cubed. I mean, if you were using the method of undetermined coefficients, you would have to guess something that could satisfy this. And it's not totally obvious what to guess with the cosine cubed. So of course you could just ask Mathematica to do it for you. That's fine. But let me just remind you of the technique for doing a problem like this, because it will come up in this part of the course a lot. So the move is um, write the cosine cubed in terms of harmonics of cosine, meaning things like cosine t, cosine 2t, cosine 3t, and also possibly sine of t, sine of 2t, and the rest. You don't want powers, you want harmonics, things with different frequencies. One, two, three, T, et cetera. And so if you can't remember the trig identity for something like cosine cubed of T, the way to do it is use complex notation. So write cosine as E to the I T plus E to the minus I T all over two and cube that. And then um, you have to remember the binomial theorem. I mean, you do have to remember something. So how to cubes an expression like that? Well, just write it all out. You get four terms. So the one half cubes up to be one eighth. And then in here we get e to the three i t plus three, and then times say this one squared times this one, which would make a three i e to the i t. Then we could also do this term times this one squared times three. So that makes plus three e to the minus i t. And then finally, the last one getting cubed, this term cubed, whoops. This one cubed gives me e to the minus three i t. And then you just have to recognize that those are cosines sitting in there. Um, so regrouping everything, this becomes one fourth cosine of three T. I get that by combining this term with this term and remembering that there's, it needs to be a two in the denominator to make it a cosine. So that's why this is only a fourth and not one eighth. And similarly, this three, Stuff with the threes give rise to three fourths um, cosine of t. Okay, so there's my nice little trig identity. And then my ordinary differential equation is y1 double dot plus y1 is equal to minus a fourth cosine t minus three fourths, wait, did I, sorry, I got that mixed up. 
Let's try that again. The one fourth has the three T. Um, this one has single T. There. Okay. And now those are, it's a little easier to guess the solutions of that. Um, except actually at this point, you have to become alert because, all right, I mean, let's just try to think about this. W what are the solutions to this? First of all, remember you're supposed to write down a homogeneous solution. That would look like A cosine T plus B sine T, that corresponds to setting this all equal to zero and solving the problem, right? So this is what we call a homogeneous solution. Meaning for the, when the right-hand side is zero, then you have to write plus the particular solution. And the particular solution when you have say a cosine three T driving a simple harmonic oscillator whose natural frequency is one, which is what this is, you should guess a constant times cosine of three T. That's what we teach. So you could just try that and you'll see that it will work. So we'll just generate cosine of three T terms again on the left. And then you just determine those that undetermined coefficient. So if you do that, you'll get a term um, that comes out to be plus one over 32 cosine of three T turns out to be that. Um, we could derive that if you really want, but, but the interesting term is not that one. The interesting term is what happens in response to this. Because now you can see why we taught you about resonance in that first differential equations course. This cosine of T is something that would cause resonance because it's driving this left-hand side at its natural frequency of one. And so you cannot guess simply a multiple of cosine of T in response to this, because if you did, it would, it's already there. It's, it's part of the homogeneous solution. It will not work. So that's where you're supposed to multiply by T, <laughs> except you don't multiply cosine T by T. It turns out you wanna go T times sine T. And if you plug that in, you'll, you'll, you can check that the particular solution will turn out to be minus three eighths T sine T. But, this is the really important term. So let me say some stuff about it in red. Um, this term causes resonance. And um, I mean, you can see that it does because the cosine of T that's driving the whole system satisfies the homogeneous problem. All right, this term. Um, so, What's interesting is that it leads to a secular term as it's called. This secular term, the term which is the resonant response, notice that it has got an amplitude proportional to T. That's a key thing. Just like with resonance, you're pushing on the system at its natural frequency, its response is gonna grow. It's gonna keep growing and it's gonna grow in proportionate time. 
Um, so in fact, this grows unbounded as time goes to infinity. I mean, it blows up as T goes to infinity, this one does. So that's an interesting problem. By the way, the word secular, let me just talk about that for a second because there could be a little confusion. You know, people talking about religion often will say someone is either religious or secular. That's the distinction. This is not the word being used in that sense. Secular here is being used in a, a sense um, that comes from astronomy where perturbation theory first arose um, in celestial mechanics. And secular comes from the same Latin root as the word for a century, siècle in French, right? Secular meaning things that occur on a very long time scale of centuries. Um, so, so you'll hear people talk about secular trends. These are long-term trends, secular variation, slow variations that take place over very long times. So that's what we're talking about here. This is a um, secular growth in the solution. So it, we're gonna be using that phrase a lot in perturbation in this part of the course. Okay, anyway, just meaning something that grows unbounded as time goes to infinity. Anyway, so now that we've got this solution for Y1, if we satisfy the initial conditions on it, um, remember those were Y1 of zero is zero, and Y1 dot of zero equals zero. You can check, I'll, I'll skip the algebra that these imply that the unknown constant B has to be negative one over 32 and the A has to be zero. So we're left with um, regular perturbation theory making the prediction that um, Y of T epsilon should be Y zero plus epsilon Y one plus the terms of order epsilon squared that we're ignoring, which copying down what we wrote will be cosine T plus epsilon times the stuff we just calculated, one over 32 um, cosine of three T minus cosine of T minus three eighths T sine T and then plus this order epsilon squared stuff. Or again, I'm gonna underline this important term. Okay. So that's our expression from regular perturbation theory. And let's see how well it does or doesn't do. Well, I mean, it has all kinds of problems compared to what we know to be the case. We already talked about how on physical grounds, we think the correct solution of this problem should be periodic in time. This is not as written periodic in time. Um, all these terms are fine. It's this term that's bad. This is not periodic in time, that's growing in time. So it's violating that important qualitative aspect of what we know to be the correct behavior. It's predicting something that grows in time. Um, so I've, I've made a little list of the problems with this. Uh, let me, I think I have an extra blank page here, which I can delete. Now let me delete this page. Okay. So, right, so the problems with this solution that I just wrote above. First of all, I just mentioned this problem. The solution should be periodic in T, but the one we wrote is not because of this secular term. 
So um, that's one thing. The other thing, as you may have noticed, is that the ordering of the terms is breaking down. In, in asymptotics, when we write y0 plus epsilon y1, we are thinking of the epsilon y1 as a small correction to the y0. It's supposed to be of order epsilon, but it will fail to be of order epsilon when this term becomes order one. In other words, once t gets to be of order one over epsilon, if you wait long enough, um, then it will no longer be true that y0 is much bigger than epsilon y1. They'll become comparable on that time scale. So that's what we mean. On that secular long time scale of one over epsilon, you're gonna to start to have trouble. Before that, everything should be okay. But once you get there, you're gonna have trouble. So um, this, is, this is not good. We don't want that. We, now let's try to understand what's causing that. Where'd that come from? I mean, what was the, the cause of this difficulty? You can see it by thinking physically that um, if you go back to this mechanical interpretation of this equation as a mass and a spring, if you think of the stiffness of the spring as being this coefficient in front of the y, it's got this epsilon y squared multiplying y. And, and that's what I meant about stiffening spring. It's sort of like its spring constant is not really constant. It depends on the displacement y. And since epsilon is positive, it's getting stiffer at larger amplitude. Um, now, when you have something that's stiffer, that tends to make the frequency go higher, right? Um, soft things have slow wiggles. Very stiff things have fast vibrations. So you'd expect some kind of alteration in the frequency due to this term. Alteration compared to what there was in the epsilon equals zero problem. Now, regular perturbation theory didn't know about that. That's the basic mistake that we made. Regular perturbation theory, just by its nature, forced us to assume that the frequency was given by the frequency at the lowest order, the Y0 frequency was one. Right, we saw a cosine of t with a frequency of one. And so we're just forever after working at the wrong frequency and that's gonna accumulate, that error is gonna accumulate. Um, and that's what's leading to the secular terms in the perturbation theory. So that was our basically what we did wrong. We used the wrong frequency and we didn't have any way out if we use regular perturbation theory. All right, so let me pause there. Do you want to ask anything about the intuition then of what's going wrong and why it all happened? Okay. Why, do the, why does the regular perturbation theory force us to assume that? Like well, I mean, so yeah, so what was happening with regular perturbation theory was that we... Um, you know, when we, when we write the problem this way, we're supposed to solve the Y zero problem. And we did, this is what it looked like. But as far as the order one problem is concerned, the natural frequency is a big one sitting right here. And so when we solve the problem, we get a solution that has frequency one, meaning, you know, this angular frequency in front of the T, omega is one. So it's just, it's just in the nature of regular perturbation theory that it gave us a lowest order solution at the wrong frequency. But wouldn't we um, obtain the corrections to the frequency when we do the higher order perturbation theory? Well, that's a good point. I mean, what's interesting, sort of, it is true that, I mean, we didn't really do anything wrong. This expression is, um, I mean, it, let's put it this way. If you had the exact solution of the problem and then you did a Taylor expansion for small epsilon of the exact solution, you would see a term that looks like this. So in, this would be the beginning of a, you know, something that would converge fine if you took infinitely many terms. But remember the whole philosophy in the course is um, we're not gonna do that. We don't want convergent series. We want asymptotic series. We want something that's gonna work well um, 
in terms of reproducing the qualitative behavior of our problem as epsilon goes to zero, keeping T fixed. And we only would like to keep one term, ideally. We don't want infinitely many terms. We would like just one or maybe a small number of terms. So this is this way that we've done things with regular perturbation theory is not gonna give us a good asymptotic representation of the true behavior. Whereas what I'm gonna do, I mean, you, so you asked Maria, would this, wouldn't this ultimately give us the correct frequency? It would, but not in a transparent way. That's the problem. Whereas the, there's a simple modification of regular perturbation theory that I wanna show now that gets this intuition across. Like if you just fix the frequency up, you can go very far just with that. And so this introduces the, uh, some of the ideas of how to get rid of unwanted secular terms, which is an idea that we'll come back when we talk about multiple scales methods in the next lecture. So anyway, this method is an early perturbation method from the, the late 1800s Poincaré Lindstedt method. Um, it's no longer state of the art, but it's instructive. So it's good for the kind of problem we're doing right now. We, we know we have a periodic solution. This method will, will give us that periodic solution to a good approximation and it will correct the frequency. Um, it's not suitable if you're interested in proving that you have a stable solution or if you wanna know the transient behavior, how does something either approach a given periodic solution or depart from it. And the methods we'll develop later are better for that. But if you just wanna know what, is there a periodic solution and what, what's it like, poincare lindstedt is perfectly good for that. So let me show you how that works. Um, here's the idea. As we keep saying, what we did wrong is we didn't approximate the frequency properly. So let's let tau be a new time variable that's gonna equal omega t, um, where omega should be the true solution for the frequency of this problem, that we don't happen to know what that is yet. But, but if we had the right frequency, it would go in here as omega. And um, we're going to then guess what the frequency is, or we'll actually systematically approximate the frequency as um, some function of epsilon that we don't know, but we're gonna determine it. And we're actually gonna um, suppose that this omega of epsilon is itself a power series in epsilon. So we'll write it as omega zero plus omega one epsilon plus, or maybe it's a little more customary to write it the other way around. Let's write it as epsilon omega one plus epsilon squared omega two plus et cetera. And we're gonna determine all those constants multiplying the epsilons um, by a certain constraint. Um, so, um, so we will determine omega by insisting, um, that it's the true frequency. And you know, therefore, um, and hence the solution is going to be two pi periodic in this new time variable tau. That is, if I've chosen omega correctly, the whole th instead of having period t or or two pi over omega, as it would in um, the original time variable, with respect to this new time variable tau, it will have period exactly two pi. So 
that's the condition that's going to give us all the coefficients in omega. So watch how this goes. Um, actually, this has the virtue that it converts the problem to something that we can use regular perturbation theory on. To one we can solve perfectly well with regular perturbation theory. So let me illustrate how this goes. Um, by the way, you, the way you could think of this is um, some people regard this as a stretched time variable. So you'll sometimes hear it called method of stretching or stretched variables. So we're somehow adjusting the time according to this in a way that depends on epsilon. All right, so let's see how our differential equation changes with respect to this. I mean, so like y dot, which was dy by d original variable t, you can think of that as being d big y, d tau, d tau by dt, where I'm now gonna call the solution, what, it's sort of like we did in multiple, or sorry, when we did boundary layers, I'm thinking of the, the Y of T in the original variables. I'm gonna name it. This looks like nonsense what I'm writing, but hopefully you'll understand what I mean. I'm gonna write it as big Y of tau, where tau is a function of T. You could think of it that way. I guess if I write it that way, it's okay. Um, actually, that, that maybe I should just write it explicitly like that. It looks fine. I mean, that's really all we're saying. So anyway, um, I'm gonna use the notation prime to mean time derivative with respect to tau and the d tau by dt, according to our little definition of tau up here is just omega. So that's how time derivatives get transformed. And if I do it a second time, y double dot will come out to be omega squared y double prime. And so my governing equation then becomes um, So in terms of tau, the ODE becomes omega squared capital Y double prime plus capital Y plus epsilon Y cubed equals zero. And I've still got the old initial conditions. Um, they are, so let's say initial condition one is y of zero is one and initial condition two is, well, it used to be y dot, but now y dot is this expression. So we should write it as omega um, y prime of zero is zero. There, so that's our new problem in terms of this tau variable. And um, the, so let's just barge in there. But the, the one conceptual thing you have to keep in mind is this, that we're going to insist on our solutions being two pi periodic with respect to this variable tau. So watch how that gets implemented because that's gonna let us determine the constants omega zero, omega one. And, and in general, we could determine all the omegas, all the omega sub i with this idea. So let's do it. All right, uh, when I said that the problem reduces to regular perturbation theory, I mean that now I can get away with saying just write y as a perturbation 
series in the usual way. And all of those are functions of tau. So plug everything in and watch the ODE now becomes, well, I have to substitute, I mean, this is my ODE here. So take that, I have to substitute for omega squared, which is omega zero plus epsilon omega one. And let me not write any quadratic terms in epsilon. So I've got that squared times y zero double prime plus epsilon y one double prime plus dot, dot, dot. Then plus the y term. So that's y zero plus epsilon y one plus epsilon times y cubed all of that stuff adds up to zero. Okay. And now, um, maybe, well, we could be also transforming the initial conditions. I mean, maybe I should list them here. So I see one becomes what? Y, is, y of zero is one, so that's uh, this expression. And so of course that's supposed to be true for all epsilon. And I see two would be it's a little more complicated because this initial condition has this omega multiplying it, which is itself dependent on epsilon. So writing it all out, I have omega zero plus epsilon omega one plus dot, dot, dot times y zero prime at zero plus epsilon y one prime at zero plus dot, dot, dot. All that stuff multiplies out to zero. Again, for all epsilon. <clears throat> okay. All right. So let's now stay calm and solve the problems at each order. So let's look at the order one problem. I feel like I want a little barrier here. Okay. So what's happening at order one? Well, let's look at the differential equation. Um, here's a y zero double prime multiplied by an omega zero squared, right? Because there's a square up there. So I'm getting a term that looks like omega zero squared y zero double prime. There's also this term y zero. And everything else has at least one power of epsilon in front of it. Um, so that's it. That's my differential equation at that order. And the initial conditions are y zero of zero is one and omega zero y zero prime of zero is zero, that's initial condition two.
Okay, so um, now we just solve that. Uh, actually, maybe it's worth just noticing something about initial condition two while we're here, which is there's two ways this could be true. Omega zero could be zero or Y zero prime at zero could be zero. If omega zero is itself zero, that's a bit extreme because um, what would happen? I mean, that, that's not gonna be the case, but let's see why that's, that can be ruled out. I mean, if that were the case, then this term would be gone and you would just have Y zero is identically zero. And that's no good because that can't satisfy this initial condition. So that is not happening. So that would violate initial condition one. So we must have the other case. Um, Yeah, stop. So I see two is just this. Okay, um, now solving the problem with those initial conditions, um, well, solving the differential equation up here, hmm. Yeah, all right. Um, solving the differential equation gives us y of zero, sorry, y sub zero of tau is cosine of tau over omega zero. Um, you could check that by plugging it in for one thing. I mean, that satisfies the initial conditions and the differential equation. And at that point, it looks like we've got our solution of, like I say, the initial conditions and the differential equation. But now we get to, with a big thunderclap, impose our two pi periodicity condition. Okay, so now is where this comes in. So this is the characteristic move in Poincaré Lynch debt. Impose the demand that um, the y, I mean, it's gonna be true at every order, is two pi periodic in tau. Again, that demand is simply saying that we've chosen omega to be the correct frequency such that two pi over omega is the correct fundamental period of the oscillation. Um, so with that demand, it then forces omega zero to be one. I mean, I want this to be, yeah. We want omega to be the fundamental frequency. And we want two pi over omega to equal the fundamental period of the oscillation. It's a little bit messy there. Let's try that again. So, um, so this determines omega zero to be one. Now, what we've got at this point is that our y zero of tau is just cosine of tau. So at this point, it doesn't look very different from what we had with regular perturbation theory. We just had cosine of t coming in at this order. Now we have it as cosine of tau. Um, and so we're only slightly stretching time. We're not stretching it at order one, t and tau agree at order one, they're the same. It's gonna be at order epsilon that we're gonna get a slight shift in the frequency. 
So that's where the money happens. That's where the action is at the next order. So this was not too interesting at this order, but, but the next order, watch how cool this is. So let me erect my barrier again. Now moving to the next order. Okay. All right, so let's do order epsilon. And this is where the method shows its virtues. So um, I think I'd better speed up a little bit here. So let me look at the differential equation again at order epsilon, reading off all the terms that have just one power of epsilon in front of them after everything gets multiplied out. You can convince yourself that it becomes this. Um, you'll get omega zero times y1 double prime plus y1. Of course, all this is nicer in Mathematica, but I thought you ought to just see it once to, to really get in under the hood and understand what's happening. The, the cubic term will give us a minus y0 cubed. Um, and then there's an interesting term, minus two omega one y0 double prime. So where is that coming from? I mean, this came from, when we did stuff that looks like we had omega squared. So when we have a term that looks like this squared, um, that, that cross term can generate a two omega zero omega one. And you have to remember that omega zero is just one, which we just determined in the step above. So, this is producing a term there's a 1 plus a 2 epsilon omega 1 plus etc which is then going to multiply this order 1 term in the second derivative that's all happening way back here whoops here this term squared times this order one, right? That times the cross term of those two generates another order epsilon term. So anyway, doing it all carefully, this is what you get at order epsilon. And you can then read off the initial conditions to be initial condition one becomes y1 plus zero is zero. Initial condition two gives, um, I think we already decided. I mean, by the same argument as before, we're going to get y1 prime at zero is zero. Um, and so now let me rewrite the ordinary differential equation above. This rewrite this thing, clean it up. So the ODE at this order. Just rewriting it a little bit. You have y1 double prime plus y1 equals. Now, notice I've arranged everything so that on the right-hand side, I have stuff known from the previous order of perturbation theory. I have y0 terms. And we already determined that y0 is cosine of tau. So plugging that all in, I get minus cosine cubed tau plus two omega one cosine of tau. And here I do my trig identity move. So I get this to be minus one quarter cosine of three tau minus three quarters minus two omega one, all times cosine of tau, where the three quarters was that other piece of the trig identity we had earlier and the two omega one is 
the term that's just coming along for the ride from here. Also multiplying a cosine of tau. And the thing is, when you look at that, now you see how to deal with the resonance. This is the term that could potentially cause resonance and that did cause resonance in regular perturbation theory. So this will cause resonance and the appearance of secular terms unless we kill it. So, but now we have the freedom to get rid of it because we can choose our omega one to get rid of it. Unless we get rid of it, um, by choosing omega one to equal three eighths. So in fact, this is the condition that allows us to determine omega one. Um, watch how this works. So this avoids secular terms. If we do that, we don't have any resonance. We don't get any secular terms in our representation of the solution. And um, by the way, notice what this is. This omega one being non-zero is telling us that our frequency is shifting a little bit by order epsilon compared to when it used to be one. It's now gonna be one plus three eighths epsilon. That's what it's predicting. There's also order epsilon squareds that we haven't calculated, but we could if we wanted to go to higher order. But you know, anyway, with this choice, it's then going to allow us to have solutions that are themselves two pi periodic in tau like we want. And as we know, it has to be the case. So if we solve the ODE with having made this choice for omega one, Could solve the ODE that remains for Y1 now that this term is gone. And that's easy. That's being driven by this non-resonant term, cosine three tau. So we can just solve it quickly. No drama. Um, we get that Y1 comes out to be one over 32 times cosine of three tau minus cosine of tau. Um, where this is the homogeneous solution from the way we talked about solving these problems earlier, and this is the particular solution. Anyway, so we can solve the Y1 and putting everything together, um, watch what we get. We get hence y of tau, which was supposed to be y zero plus epsilon y one plus dot, 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 comes out to be, now this is an asymptotic method. So I'm gonna write asymptotic to cosine of tau um, plus, I'm not actually super interested in that order epsilon term. I mean, we could include it if we want, but the nice thing is just the first term gives us an excellent approximation. That is, if I just write cosine of one plus three eighths epsilon, the corrected frequency times the original variable T, I'm gonna just make a small error that truly is order epsilon and is not, um, it doesn't produce any secular terms at all. I mean, we already saw that this, this correction term, notice there's no secular terms here. This correction term is bounded for all tau.
right? That thing isn't growing. That's just oscillating. That's some little oscillation, but we don't care about that too much because it's truly order epsilon. So now let me show you what Mathematica has to say about all this. So let me jump out of my notability here and share a different screen with you. Um, so I'll share my desktop and let's see. So let me open this up. Here's Mathematica. Maybe I'll make it a tiny bit bigger. Okay, so let's do the problem for a moderately small epsilon of 0.1. And so let me now solve the problem numerically. I mean, it is a nonlinear differential equation. It's not, if you try to ask it for what the exact solution is, I think Mathematica could probably do it in terms of elliptic functions. But this is not a course in elliptic functions, so I don't wanna show you the elliptic function solution, although it's interesting. But instead, let's just, do it um, numerically, it produces this interpolating function, which if you graph it, there it is. So that's the numerical solution for y with the given initial condition that it's one and it has zero derivative at, at time one. So it's, it's an oscillation like we expected. Now compare that to what regular perturbation theory would give us. So regular perturbation theory gives us this formula that I derived earlier, cosine of T plus this epsilon term with this growing 3 eighths T sine T term, right? There's that secular term that we don't like. And you can see it doing its mischief in that the orange solution is growing linearly in time. If I only, if I truncate at this order and that's disagreeing with the blue curve. Although you'll notice at the beginning, it was fine, right? It's because it's breaking down on time scales of order one over epsilon. It's starting to screw up. For times much shorter than that, I mean, what? So epsilon was one tenth. So this should be okay up till time about 10, and it is. But then it's messing up for times substantially longer than 10. But compare that to Poincare Lindstedt. That method, um, produces, as we saw, this expression, cosine of one plus three eighths epsilon t. And there you can't see the difference between the numerical and the um, perturbative approximation, even on time scales well, well into one over epsilon. I mean, you're here already at five times one over epsilon, and it's still working like a charm. So this, this method gives you a really nice approximation on that time scale. Now it's not perfect um, if there is an error. And so if you ask how different is the numerical solution from this approximation, well, it produces an error. You can see there's a little error there. That function is not identically zero, but it's small. It's order epsilon, it looks like on that time scale. Now I was curious, and so I thought, why don't I just zoom in and see what is it really? Well, that's what it looks like. Now, at first that was a bit alarming, but notice that these numbers are small. This is 0 0.02. This is like order epsilon squared, which would be right 0 0.01. So you're getting errors of order epsilon squared. And that's not surprising. We only went to order epsilon in this calculation. And in particular, we're seeing some secular growth, which might worry us. But what is this secular growth? Well, that secular growth is behaving like epsilon squared times T. I mean, it's a very weak secular growth. And the reason it's happening is because we didn't calculate the epsilon squared correction to the frequency. If we had, we could get rid of this and so on. So you can just get rid of as many secular terms as you want by just calculating the frequency more and more carefully. But anyway, the main point is that this is a small correction on the time scales that we were looking at. All right, so that was um, all I wanted to say about the Poincaré Lynchdet method. Let me see what's going on in the chat here. Um, why does the frequency of the oscillations appear to be constant? Shouldn't it oscillate faster and faster? Um, I'm not sure why you would say that. 
I mean, we were calculating a constant frequency. It had a correction that was a little bit different from one, but it was still a constant. So we're not expecting it to oscillate faster and faster. Maybe I don't understand the question. Do you want to ask it out loud? Yeah, so if we go to the plot be before where we were plotting the solutions, okay. the solutions after like time 50, and uh, weren't we saying that because the, like it's a, uh, what's it called, the, the, the spring is strengthening, so then yes. the oscillations should get, should get faster? Maybe they're faster than they would have been otherwise. I mean, they're instead of being at frequency one, they're now at frequency one plus three epsilon. So they're faster in that sense, but they're not getting faster in time because the spring is still uh, causing oscillations at a constant amplitude. Notice that the Y is not changing its amplitude. So you're not stretching the spring more as time goes on. It's still the same stretch at all times. Okay, I understand, thank you. You know what I mean? The amplitude doesn't change over time. However, you raise a good point, which can occur. So I, I was planning to do a little more writing. Um, let's see if I have some writing. Yeah, rather than writing, can I just show you some stuff in Mathematica? Uh, I don't have time to write it out. I'm gonna leave this plot and show you one other phenomenon, which is another way that secular terms can happen. It's if I use um, a different little model problem, which is suppose I'm studying a, a non, a, just a regular linear oscillator, but it has a damping term. Okay, contrast that with the problem I did where there was no damping, but I had a, a cubic restoring force. Suppose, I don't know if you can see it here. Is it big enough? I mean, my new equation is a simple harmonic oscillator, y double prime plus y, but I've got a damping term two epsilon y prime. So what happens if I put in weak damping? That's a little bit too big, I think. So I'm gonna, oh God, I didn't mean to stop sharing altogether. Sorry. Um, I want to just make this a little smaller for the sake of my own screen. Um, here I used an epsilon of 1 50th. So let's watch what happens. This is a linear problem. Mathematica has no problem solving it. It, it gives me uh, some exact solution in terms of a cosine of t, a sine of t. I think I actually have the wrong epsilon. Let me go back and make this epsilon. Let me have it solve this problem again. Yeah, that's with the correct epsilon. I get this funny formula, which is just sines and cosines with an exponential damping, because we know it's a linear damped oscillator. Okay, but now compare the exact solution to what you would get if you did regular perturbation theory. It turns out regular perturbation theory would give you an expression that looks like this, cosine of t, then you get a minus epsilon t, a secular term, minus epsilon t, cosine of t. That same kind of resonance effect, but now it's giving us an epsilon t cosine t, and then there's another term, epsilon sine t. So I didn't have time to write this out, but regular perturbation theory would give you this. And it doesn't look too terrible at short enough times. Regular perturbation theory seems to be agreeing with the exact solution. However, if you go out to longer times like time of 100, where here, remember my epsilon was 1 50th. So time scale of one over epsilon would be time scale of 50. So let me go out to two times that. And now you see that the regular perturbation theory is screwing up because the true solution is blue. It's got an exponentially damped amplitude. Whereas regular perturbation theory deals pretty well with the initial part, but then this secular term, this epsilon t cosine t, eventually starts to lead to linear growth in this amplitude, which is totally wrong. So, Next time, I'm gonna show you the method of multiple scales, which can rectify this. And it's how you can handle problems with weak damping. Um, and you know, in, it also includes the poincare lynch step method as a special case. So sorry, I went a minute or two over, but um, so next time we'll start method of multiple scales in earnest, now that you see that regular perturbation theory really is not up to the task for these nonlinear oscillator problems. Okay, so see you next time.